Well, welcome everyone. Um, feel free if you want to join with your camera. Um, we're, it looks like we're a pretty intimate group. So if you're comfortable, if you want to, we can all sort of be in the room together. Um, why don't I read some of the book? It's pretty long. And so I'll give you like a snapshot, like an excerpt of the book. How about that? Um, so I'm just gonna go right over here to this other camera. And um, Josh, also feel free to narrate over me. Like, so anything that occurs to you or at any point, if you want to chime in, please feel free. Um, okay, so I'm excited to share this with you guys. Um, I just, I feel compelled to turn it <laughs> and show you the spine and um, the, sh the shimmer. See if I can get that shimmer. There we go. And also this sort of case, uh, what we call a case in picture books is pretty, this has a little bit of squish to it. Um, so this is a book, part of what I love about it is how it feels in the hand, that it actually has this kind of um, quality of, of really being like an object that you want to hold. And uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I noticed that. What, um... That's, that's what every, all my uh, boys were commenting on. They, they really like the, the pillowiness of it. <laughs> was, yeah. that a, was that a choice by, by any of you guys? Or is that like a... I love that word. That's a good way to put it. Josh, talk about the pillowiness. Um, I just, uh, I, I think I've, I, I just have like really good memories of, uh, of books in my past that have had really uh, squishy um, covers to it. And I feel like the last uh, handful of years, I've seen some artist books. Um, there was, a, I'm trying to remember which artist book, if there was one uh, that sort of inspired me. Um, but I, I, I can't remember, maybe it was at MoMA or something, but I saw one and it was like really, like really, really squishy. And so I wanted to, uh, try to find something like that. And this was a sort of a happy compromise. Um, also something, a, a book without a, uh, a um, sort of a cover slip, slip jacket on it, I thought would, would be appropriate for Keith. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, this talk today, we kind of thought about it as being a little bit about process, about the creative process of making the book. So I'm glad that we got sort of derailed by the, by the, the, the squishy case because that's really part of what we wanted to talk about today is the collaboration and the process of making a book like this and and there's a little more like Josh and I were texting each other and it was really at the final stage before the book went to print and so it was that last minute decision where Josh and I were texting back and forth and we were like do we want the squish do you want the padded case like how does that feel and we we could we didn't have the time to test it, to, to, did we, Josh? Uh, no, we, we had one sample, um, but I, I couldn't even, I couldn't quite tell. And it was, uh, the sample came like after we made the, the decision. Right, right. Yeah. And so um, for you guys who love picture books and are interested in picture book making, um, the traditional thing would be a book jacket. So it'd be a hard case and then a book jacket over it, which has its own pleasures. Cause I mean, when you take a book jacket off, then there's often, there's often a different image on the case. And so it's kind of an unwrapping. But what I love about this is um, it almost feels embraceable and kind of toy-like. Like it's just a pleasure to hold in the hand, um, which feels also like Keith might approve. Keith liked toys and he liked um, buttons and stickers and that kind of, that kind of stuff um, that he filled the pop shop with both in, Soho and Tokyo. And so it just, it felt like an inspired choice to me. So in at the last minute, Josh and I were going back and forth. We're like, let's go with it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> there was that little bit of risk, you know, it was kind of a, a last minute choice. All right. So here we go. I'm going to open it. These are the end papers. Um, another pleasure of picture books is that, that first thing that you get when you open it. And, um, and we start with two epigraphs. Uh, one, the first is by Keith. In a way, it's as important to communicate to one person, to one 10-year-old person that's growing up, 
as it is to try to make any big effect on the entire world. And then another contributor, Timothy Leary, who maybe has never contributed an epigraph in a children's book before. Um, this one, he's there painting on walls and running around the world and kids flock to watch him do it. The intensity, the way he approaches a wall with total openness is the way he approaches you. Keith is in the best sense of the word, childlike, open. This is a special um, version where Josh personalized it with this drawing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, here's the title page and here we go. Here is Keith Haring painting a mural with hundreds of children in Tama City, Japan. Keith draws the outlines and the kids fill them in with their own designs. When Keith was a kid, he and his dad often drew together. They took turns making lines and watched as a balloon became an ice cream cone or a dog transformed into a fire breathing dragon. Sometimes they even drew with their eyes closed. Keith drew all the time everywhere, but not on the walls his mother would call, just as he was getting some big ideas. Keith was the oldest in his family and gradually as he grew, three sisters arrived. First Kay, then Karen, and finally when Keith was 12, Kristen was born. They lived in Kutztown, a small town in Pennsylvania. Keith loved being a big brother. In the summer, he organized games and carnival contests in the backyard, and he would invite the entire neighborhood. He also farmed, formed clubs with secret passwords and made little houses where friends would play. When Christian was old enough to hold a crayon, Keith invented a game like the one his dad had taught him. Each would draw on a sheet of paper, and when someone shouted, stop, they'd swap sheets and continue drawing. Keith also painted Kristen's hands and pressed them on paper to make prints. Look, a mobile. Keith's best friend, Kermit, loved making things too. At school, they were known as the artists. Eager to have a studio all their own, they cleared some space in Kermit's aunt's garage. Keith loved drawing anything with a twisting, turning line that traveled through and around, up and down, in and out again. When Keith was 16, he began to feel restless and cuts down. That summer, he caught a bus to Ocean City, New Jersey, where he lived a block from the beach with kids from Pittsburgh and New York City. Keith washed dishes to pay his way, and in his free time, he drew. Sometimes he would stay up all night and watch the sunrise. After high school, Keith moved to Pittsburgh to study commercial art, but it wasn't a good fit. He wanted to be spontaneous and free, following his line to see where it would lead. On a trip home for Christmas, Keith stumbled upon The Art Spirit by Robert Henri. After a few sentences, he felt as if the book was speaking directly to him, like a friend. Do whatever you do intensely. The artist leaves the crowd and goes pioneering. So Keith left school, took several jobs and saved enough money to hitchhike across the country. He was searching for his next big step and he took the art spirit with him. The music, dance, and visual arts, the forms of expression, the arts of hope. This is where I think I fit in. Art will never leave me and never should. When Keith returned to Pittsburgh, he spent hours in the library reading about artists he admired. He also saw an exhibition of enormous paintings by Pierre Alashinsky. Keith was blown away. Inspired, Keith now knew what he had to do to find the intensity and freedom he desired. I remember during the process of Josh making the images, he texted me one day and said, what should I put on the license plate? And I was like, how about intensity or some, some version of intensity? Do you remember that? I remember, yeah. 
in Kevin City's world. <clears throat> One of those, I mean, another pleasure of picture books is like the hidden details. And that's often the illustrator's sort of job and pleasure of like embedding those details so that you can linger over a page and catch new things every time. Yeah. Like this page. Keith arrived in New York City and enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. He was 20 years old. One day he found rolls of paper that someone had tossed into the gutter. He enrolled them in the studio at school and began making bigger and bigger paintings. One of the challenges of like finding an illustrator for a particular biographical subject is you have to think about that subject and there's so many sort of boxes the artist has to tick to kind of fit for that particular project. Especially in this case, you just feel like you need someone who knows New York City and loves New York City and understands New York City um, and like the variety and the density of the city. And this, this spread by Josh really exemplifies that for me um, about what, one of the reasons why Josh was the perfect artist for this book. And, uh, and this is that kind of page where you can just like, your eye can travel across the page and take in so many great details, including for me, the fashions. <laughs> like the sort of 80s inspired fashions. And just, you know, for those of you out there who are artists, you can really appreciate how much goes into that. That just in a page like this, think about how many outfits you're designing and how many like different characters you're creating. It's, it's amazing. Keith especially likes painting on the floor by the open door where the sunlight poured in. People passing on the street would stop to watch or talk with him about what he was making. Keith loved it. He didn't believe that some people understand art while others don't, or that art should be hidden away in galleries, museums, and private collections. Keith wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. The public has a right to art. Art is for everybody. Another thing about, another challenge of uh, biographical children's books is the details have to be historically accurate. Um, and so you really, you, you kind of have to do that um, in order for the book to feel, you know, precise and attentive to the details of the time. And so one of the, like a backstory picture of this, Josh, do you remember? Yeah. This was the first spread that, that I uh, did kind of as a test. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he was, uh, Keith was drawn uh, really differently, actually. Like uh, I had him, he had like a, a ventilator on and he was spray painting lines, you know, on the floor. But then uh, we had a conversation and you were like, no, 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 that was, that was much later. <laughs> so uh, it, I, I think that was a really good conversation for me because, uh, uh, it got me to start thinking about this in terms of, you know, like, uh, uh, in terms of like fact checking and the accuracy goes. Yeah, exactly. Um, another illustrator that I'm working with is taking on a, probably taking on a biographical picture book. And that's one of the things. Was that I breaking up? About. Oh, am I breaking up? Josh? I think Josh is breaking up. Oh, Josh. Okay, so I'll plow ahead for a second and then we'll turn to him. There oh, you are, Josh. Sorry. The East Village. Oh, was that breaking up there? You, you were for a second. second. Oh, really? Okay, I'm going to, you keep talking. I'm going to uh, bring this out to the other room uh, with my mask on. So you keep going. Okay. Um, the East Village was Keith's new neighborhood. With his friends, he formed Club 57, a local hangout in the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. A few years later, when Keith was 23, he fell in love with a DJ named Juan DeBose. Keith listened to Juan's music while he drew, and Juan cooked big meals in their tiny kitchen. Together, they were happy. Keith wasn't earning money from his paintings yet. So he worked as a bicycle messenger, a sandwich maker on 7th Avenue, a bartender at the Mud Club, and an art assistant in a Soho gallery. 
He even got a job picking wildflowers in New Jersey. But his favorite job ever was drawing with children at a daycare center in Brooklyn. There is nothing that makes me happier than making a child smile. With his artist friend, Fab Five Freddy, Keith walked through Alphabet City admiring all of the graffiti. He loved the colors, the size, the fluid lines, and the blossoming of art on the streets where people could see and enjoy it. One night, while strolling down King Street in the West Village, Keith heard the thump and beat of music and discovered Paradise Garage. He was mesmerized by the dancers spinning on their heads and doing the electric boogie as disco and hip hop rocked the room. For Keith, drawing and painting were like dancing. He called it mind to hand flow. This is another one of those spreads, um, also Ben's screen <laughs> backdrop right now, but that um, kind of knocked me out when I was, you know, for me in the writing, the writing was all done um, in advance before we gave it to Josh. Of course, we went back and revised a ton once we saw the way that the words and the images were working together. Then I just started pulling, 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 pulling words out. Um, because part of the, the art of the picture book is that the words and the images are working together and it's not merely, it's not decorative of course, and it's, it's about building a world and making sure that there, there's a gap or there's a space between the words and the images. But Josh, I wanted to ask about this spread um, uh -huh. for you. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, this, this spread I, I knew uh, was gonna be like a kind of a, showstopper spread i guess yeah and so i like uh saved it till the end or very close to the end you know i wanted to like uh work on some of these other uh other spreads that uh i could like practice a little bit on you know just to like get the flow of it or just to like um uh like i wasn't sure how i was going to paint the people or how i was going to draw the people and then um by the time I was like at this part of the book, I was like super warmed up and I was ready to go and uh, uh, just ready to start jamming on it, you know. So uh, it, it was really good and 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 funny enough, like when I when I did this one, it just went really fast. Like it just uh, really I didn't I didn't have to like labor over it at all. I just kind of busted it out. Uh, really fun. I oh I'm sorry. And, sorry. What about the cameos for the? people who are here oh yeah um i mean there's a basquiat in here there's like a devo hat i think next to the person yes i don't think you can see that yeah and uh kind of a like i i definitely a madonna there yeah um <laughs> who else did i put uh and maybe some friends of mine are snuck in there here and there you know yeah yeah uh and then of course you know keith and juan uh they're in the middle um yeah, it was really fun to uh, paint this one. One day in the subway, Keith noticed blank panels where advertisements used to be. Suddenly he zipped up to the street, bought a box of white chalk, dashed back downstairs and began drawing on the walls. This is um, also kind of a noteworthy spread in a way because if you look at it, you, those of you who are attending, you might um, not notice, or you might notice that one of Josh's challenges was in representing and giving the feeling for Keith's art without replicating or duplicating it exactly. Um, and that was one of the constraints of the book was, was to try to figure out how to do that. Like, how do you capture Keith's spirit, energy, mood aesthetic without like um imitating it and uh and and even more literally when you when you when you like create a, an image that is recognizably keith um we worked within the constraints of not sort of duplicating it entirely um just you want to comment on that yeah uh you know initially um the the chalk drawing there i think um I think I had like uh, one of one of the drawings where uh, Keith, where there's like 
people kind of on each other's shoulders. It's like a very classic uh, Keith Haring um, motif that he would do um, throughout his career. And uh, it wasn't like completely finished, but then we had a whole conversation about it and, uh, and our publisher was like, it was a little bit too close. So I did a, I think I did another version where it was like a big heart maybe, and it was like too generic. Uh, and then uh, we sort of landed on this uh, in-between stage and, you know, luckily, you know, knock on wood, we haven't uh, yeah. had any calls about that, which is uh, great. Um, and I, I also really, I, I had a, a great time um, working on the sort of like subway um, graffiti and also the, the textures in the subway. Uh, mm -hmm. I love uh, those of you guys who have, who've been to New York City. Um, I'm sure you've seen like when people tear the posters off the wall and there's like residual um, posters of like years and years of other posters on top of it. and. Uh, it creates this really amazing kind of like torn uh, marbled effect of just like grime and paper and everything. And so I wanted to uh, have like moments of that. Um, so I took a lot of the, I, I was, I've been painting with um, acrylic wash and um, I would take a lot of the leftover um, dried up acrylic bits and, um, and uh, matte medium them onto the board to create this really like rich texture that uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to just, you know, paint out of my head or whatever. So it was really fun to kind of let go and uh, get into get into it that way. Hmm. Great. Um, all right, do you, is this is this working? Should we just kind of keep moving and talking? Is that working? <laughs> I mean, we have, <laughs> how, how's, how's, can you guys hear me with the mask on and everything? Yeah, yeah, it's great. No, this is this is this is great, guys. Um, I'm kind of enjoying this, so let's just keep going. And by the way, for those of you who are attending, feel free to um, ask any questions that come up for you, or or you can just fire them off in the chat. Like, since with yeah. such a since it's an intimate group, we might as well take advantage of that. So please don't hesitate to to chime in because we're here to for that reason. We can we can also uh, you know um, one one sort of detail that I would like to bring up too was. Uh, um, perhaps earlier on in the process, I was feeling really uh, kind of discouraged about it and I wasn't really sure how to finish it. You know, like I was, I felt stuck with it. And Matthew and I uh, had this uh, really kind of candid conversation where uh, we were just talking about like really channeling some of uh, the joy and, um, you know, kind of the the essence of Keith's uh, art making um, into the process of making this book, you know? And um, I think this spread in particular really uh, exemplifies that. Um, and as soon as I, I felt like after we had that conversation, you know, I just felt like I could uh, let go a bit, you know, I stop. I was like really, you know, stressed out about making the book look a certain way or um, you know, I knew a lot of like my peers would see it and or even people that um, like Keith Haring fans would like hold it up to, you know, this like icon and legend, you know, someone that's influenced me, you know, uh, for much of my career. Uh, and, and as soon as I sort of like let go of uh, of some of that, I just really um, had a lot of fun with it and the 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 work just kind of flowed out of me in a way, which was something very much, um, which I think uh, embodies uh, Keith's um, kind of his uh, ideas about making art. Were you, were you trying to like avoid a certain style or something? Is that, is that? Yeah, I was, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I didn't want to make work that looked like my editorial work or my commercial work, you know, I wanted to have work that could stand on its own and that could um, uh, live in its own kind of universe um, that also done by hand. I'm sure, you know, uh, Ben, you, you just finished a book too. So like just having, uh, I think just, just by not working digitally uh, helped create this uh, sort of like a different language for me, you know, um, with this book. Yeah. Um, um, the reference. Um, also is to that, remember a few pages ago when I was talking about Robert Henri and the art, the art spirit, 
that book yeah. was one of Keith's kind of Bibles. Like it was one of his go-to books that he carried with him and that meant a ton to him in terms of his own philosophy of art, understanding of what art is and should do. And one of the things, in, one of these passages in the book that, that really has stayed with me is uh, that Robert Henri theorized that like the feeling that the artist has embodied, the embodied feeling that the artist has in the act of making, like in the act of making a stroke or making a line is transmitted to the viewer. That there's an actual energetic transmission that comes from how you're feeling while you're making. And mm -hmm. um, so obviously that meant a lot to Keith and you can see that in his work. And so it was one of those conversations that we got to have where it was like trying to push through a, you know, a stuck place and kind of getting that reminder that like, enjoy it, like find the fun, find the play, find the dance, like find, like try to summon up that energy um, cause it's gonna be more effective. It's gonna sing, you know, the image will sing in that, in that way. I mean, I, I found, I found, I found myself like when I was uh, painting it, I would, uh, I would notice that like my whole body would be like tensed up, you know, like I was like really, you know, worried or like I was like wanting to be really careful, uh, like holding the brush tightly and everything, and uh, just having that reminder to kind of like just take a breath and relax a bit and. Um, try to to uh, get into that place where you're really enjoying working with the medium and just like I'm like you know I'm I'm doing this cool painting here of uh, you know something that I really love and um, having that reminder I think helps you said you did it digitally first correct yeah yeah I have some uh, I can show after uh, we're done with this part I can show you guys a little bit of my uh, sort of the digital process of this I, ha I have that on a PDF was it also because you haven't worked in real media for a while? Is that why you were you felt like you were fighting it? Yeah, I you know I I spent most of my career almost primarily working digitally in Photoshop, and uh, um, or emulating like silk screen or emulating um, some sort of uh, traditional uh, media, even though I, I'm you know classically trained. Um, uh, but it's been it, it's been a really long time since I made work by hand that was done in a professional manner, you know. So I I had it, it took a, quite a while for me to figure out, and I think that was part of the reason why this <laughs> this is probably why the reason why this book took so long to finish. You know, we uh, we were working on this for like, or mostly me, I was working on this for four years off and on. <laughs> So yeah, I, I just needed some time to, uh, you know, I'd like that one spread that Matthew uh, showed earlier where Keith's like drawing on the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did that spread like four or five times, you know, as well as other like uh, tests, you know, here and there of the various characters. And I remember you saying that it was that choice for you to paint it rather than do it digitally. Right. Um, be, in part because like Keith is one of your artistic heroes and you just felt like you wanted to challenge yourself? Yeah, I just, I, I don't know if this is like a old school mentality, you know, like, like, you know, like I have to, I had to make it by hand, but it does feel like his whole, you, you know, I, I feel like kind of his, uh, his process was so much about, you know, making a mess and like, uh, you know, having these trips and like all this like tangible, you know, painting energy. And I, that's something that I, I just did not feel confident that I could bring that into yeah. the book if I did it digitally. You know, I'm just like, it's like too clean. There's not, there's too much of a safety net, you know, when you're working um, digitally. Uh, there had to be like a, a decent amount of risk with this uh, for it to be uh, fun for me in a way. <laughs> Yeah. In a really messed up way, yeah. No, but that's that's an amazing thing to think about how the risk and how the risk is important in our own creative practice, but also specifically with Keith, because I don't know if everyone realizes that he would approach these walls with most of the time no preliminary sketches, which is almost unheard of. So for him, it was in fact a dance and it was in fact a sacred moment of like having the confidence and the swagger and the just 
audacity in the best sense of the word to step up to a wall and just go. And mm-hmm. like anything that was a mistake, wasn't a mistake. It was turned into something else. Mm-hmm. And that is an amazing thing about Keith Haring. Like, I think when you, f- when you see his work in person, especially, and you start to appreciate the quickness and the speed and the spontaneity, um, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you don't quite get that with t-shirts and like reproductions. Yeah, there's, there's no, you know, he's not like sketching out the lines or he's not like doing like practice strokes or whatever, you know, it's just like one shot, you know, he, he, he used this uh, enamel called literally called one shot, which is, uh, uh, it's just, it's like a sign painting uh, enamel that uh, um, is really like impossible to get out is super permanent. And um, I think that uh, uh, we, Matthew gave me a copy of his journals too, uh, which I highly recommend for uh, everyone uh, watching this. Um, his journals really talk quite a bit about his um, um, art making process and just sort of his uh, his mentality um, when creating things. Um, and a lot of it really is about this idea of like, you know, no eraser, no, uh, yeah. no preliminary sketch and just kind of have an at it, you know. And um, that, yeah, like he makes one move and then he'll counter that with another, with another part of a drawing and add on to that, you know, like sort of this becomes like a living and breathing thing, you know, which is uh, incredible in a way. And it's connected to his courage, uh, like the way he approached his life, his short life, you know, like the way he approached every day um, and the way he dealt with being, a gay artist in in the 70s and 80s there's just such incredible courage and uh like a refusal to hide and a refusal to not be fully enjoying his life um and so that's something that also was important to me in terms of the spirit of the book and like the message that i wanted to send to the reader to you know which is primarily child readers but also the the grown-up readers too which is like to try to see if I could convey some of that confidence or confidence isn't quite the right word, but just like this relentless, like determination to just enjoy. So, life. so honest, you know, he like never uh, would uh, second, it didn't feel like he was second guessing himself or like trying to, um, you know, go back on, you know, who he was. You're just unapologetically uh, yeah. him, you know? Um, and I think the work really exemplifies that. One, um, I know I've turned a couple pages just to sort of keep showing you different spreads and giving you <laughs> other glimpses. But but I just happened to turn to this one and kind of a um, an interesting story is that I wrote the book in Berlin. My My husband lives in Berlin and um and it was in the summer of 2015 and i was i was living there between semesters at brooklyn college uh in berlin and um of course you can't see this but this is that moment when keith was invited to west germany to paint the berlin wall um and which was promptly like pretty quickly painted over but that was that was the deal it was not about uh, being precious or preserving it, it was about um, the act of doing it. So you can't actually see it now, but there's really, there's some great photos that you can see of that moment. It was, uh, it was also um, uh, really important for us to, I think we had a conversation about, you know, finishing this book uh, during this time um, when uh, we were having like such kind of uh, intense conversations about, you know, putting up walls and, you know, uh, the border to our country and all the, all the kind of upheaval that's been going on. And I think, I think that uh, very, very early on, I think this was something that uh, we wanted to really, you know, release during this, this period of time in history, you know, because um, it was so clear to see the, the similar things that were happening. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, I, that was definitely intentional in the title, like drawing on walls as a title communicates like rebellion against rules or restrictions a little bit. Um, 
you know, taking something like it's kind of articulated in this line where it says, uh, he was invited to West Germany to paint a stretch of the Berlin Wall, which had been built to divide people, even family and friends and keep them apart. Keith believed in the unity of all human beings. So he painted a long chain of interconnected figures. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit of this dimension where it was speaking to the politics of the moment, but um, obviously in a way that would be hopefully timeless and that it wouldn't only speak to that moment, but that it would endure uh, beyond that. Um, should we just, Kind of let me, I'll just read a couple more pages and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, it, yeah? Yeah. 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 Um, and Keith did love life every single day, no matter what difficulties came his way. Even when he learned that he had a serious illness called AIDS, Keith didn't stop making art and sharing his gifts with the world. He was overwhelmed by sadness at first, but then he decided that he would live each day fully as if it were his last. I appreciate everything that has happened, especially the gift of life I was given that has created a silent bond between me and children. Children can sense this thing in me. One morning while listening to musicians on a New York City street, Keith was recognized in the crowd by a father and son from Italy. Keith invited them to his studio. In return, they invited him to paint a mural and have an exhibition. In June, 1989, Keith arrived in Pisa to paint a wall on the church of San Antonio. The friars who lived there welcomed him to dinner inside their monastery. As word spread, people came from all over Europe to meet Keith and watch him work. A massive crowd waited for Keith to make his final mark. When he did, everyone burst into wild cheering and applause. The city threw a huge party with music and dancing in the streets. Kids, grandparents, soldiers, friars, everyone celebrated Keith's masterpiece. Without question, he said, Pisa is one of the highlights of my entire career. From the time he was four years old, drawing with his dad at the kitchen table until the day he died at 31, Keith remained spontaneous and free, following his line wherever it would lead. And though his life ended too soon, Keith's line is still with us. And it goes on forever. This, this page, this page uh, was also really exciting because we together, we made a couple choices. One was to um, not put a period where it kind of belongs like grammatically speaking, you know, a grammarian type would say like, you know, there, where's the period? But we wanted that feeling of like expansiveness and not ending. And so we, were, we left that. And then also this choice to like have this big space um, to let that moment land or lift um, was another kind of moment of, of our collaboration and talking about how that could work. So, so that's it. <laughs> um, okay. I, sh sh should I show some of the sketches? Yes, please. While, yeah. we're, while we're here. Thanks for reading that. Just, just busted the whole book. <laughs> almost, almost. Yeah, that was fun. I haven't read it aloud in a while. And it's, I know. I could feel I could feel myself uh, just uh, chilling out here in my office chair. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, oh here we go. This was sort of um, my sketch um, PDF that we did. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but you guys can kind of see a little bit of the process. Um, I uh, drew a lot of the, uh, pretty much everything I drew on the, on the computer uh, relatively quick, you know. Um, uh, one thing that I'm glad that I did on a just uh, bookmaking um, thing uh, was, I, I'm really glad that I retyped out uh, Matthew's manuscript and tried to uh, place it out, you know, like 
as I was uh, figuring out the compositions for the pages. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, we kind of went through all this and there was a lot of notes. Some of these spreads kind of stayed the same. Um, some of them uh, got changed, like here's this one. Um, I also like, I also wanted to, oh yeah, here's the Paradise Garage spread. I, I, I like to kind of keep the sketches as loose as I can, um, just so I can uh, maintain some amount of spontaneity when I work on the final, you know. Uh, this one was, uh, this one I think was too, you know, this was, this is an example of a spread that uh, maybe was too close to uh, Keith Haring. Um, and something's got sort of shifted around Here's this an early version of that spread. Um, round two, you can kind of see as they tighten up. I still try to keep it fairly loose here. Um, oh, and this is the actual book. Um, I'm trying to find the. I'm gonna look at my Dropbox real quick. I'm curious to see the color uh, versions that you worked on. I know that's what I'm trying to. Let's see. It's was so there, funny when, was there a reason when was, that you couldn't, you guys couldn't like draw, like I don't know, more more like Keith. Like, is was there like a? How closely did you work with like, I don't know, the, the estate or or, like, what were the limitations of 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 that? Uh, nothing. It was it, it wasn't there wasn't like a piece of paper. You know, there wasn't like. We didn't talk to anyone about this specifically about what we could include or what we. Well, actually, I think our publisher did talk to a lawyer um, uh, throughout the process. Um, yeah, so here's the color version. So yeah, you can kind of tell. It's like let me pull up the other. I sort of I would use this as um, a color guide. Let's see, you know. Here we go. So here's the, here is the final painted version. And then, um, whoop. and then here's the, uh, the digital version. Uh, so um, I, it's almost like I made two books in a way, you know, like I, I like made the whole thing. I like drew it out kind of how I wanted to draw it. Uh, um, Here's this other spread. Um, I, I think we have this one. This is one of the paintings that's in the show at Nucleus. Um, but everything's outlined here. You know, I wasn't making like painting decisions about what's going to remain a shape and what's going to be part of the drawing. Uh, one part of the book I knew um, from the beginning is I really wanted to let the story of his line kind of be this sort of like um, subtle secondary story, you know, like, and, and um, I tried to keep that as like the most contrasty moment in the spread, like either using pure black or pure white, you know, uh, so you can like very easily follow it uh, throughout the, the book as the book uh, progresses. Um, also, we try to do that with the cover too, with kind of this uh, uh, spot varnish just on the uh, line work, um, just to make a pop, you know nerdy stuff like that <laughs> no, that's, that's, um, so everything else is like not as not as contrasted as uh as the line work that's that's an interesting choice yeah i uh i think it, i think i just you know i all right here it is yeah i think that's kind of the beauty of you know painting versus uh you know working perhaps um the way I was mocking it up, you know, um, it just was like, it was like almost too cartoony in a way for me. Um, and it wasn't really kind of giving um, space for uh, this other kind of uh, secondary character, which was uh, the line, Keith line. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was really great, you know, and like, and like uh, Matthew was saying, there's a lot of moments uh, in these spreads that I uh, was able to kind of like insert my own, you know, weird 
stuff into it, you know, like I really love this, um, this little cup of water with like, like a pencil and something in it, you know, like a weird kind of distorted moment. Uh, here's like the, like with this spread, this is a, a sort of a face that uh, Keith draws quite a lot in his work. And uh, this is like one way that I would sneak in his sort of like a nod to uh, his work. Um, uh, obviously, like with the with the cover, you know, um, and I would I would try to like uh, kind of like echo like his like uh, some of the shapes, you know, but still changing them a bit, like echo like the 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 bubbly feeling of uh, some of the shapes and like kind of how they uh, like right here, you know, like how he uses like squiggles and how he would like have those like um, exclamation lines, you know, for a lot of stuff. Uh, that was something that I, I really wanted to uh, bring in. And also I think it's, it's a type of mark making that's really um, it's part of, you know, the zeitgeist now in 2021, you know, like in a lot of the art that's happening around here. I, I mean, I see like, uh, uh, moments of, you know, kind of reverberations of uh, Keith Haring's work uh, with a lot of people um, work as well. Um, so yeah, it was a, uh, it was kind of a crazy, uh, it was kind of a uh, crazy experience overall, um, messing around with this, uh, these, um, here's another one doing these spreads. Oh yeah, this one, for instance, uh, it just, it, you know, I was doing the book. I did the book, a lot of the book like this and um, gradually as the process um, went on, you know, I started getting looser and looser with these uh, sketches, you know, like this just felt, um, uh, after a while it just got almost too tight, you know, like I just wanted to uh, keep the book a little bit looser. Did when you showed this to like the editor and Matthew and stuff, so for the longest time they were expecting sort of like outlined paintings, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Was it? I don't know. Were they were they surprised or? Yeah, the, you know, I I think I was really fortunate. Oh yeah, here's the spread. I was really fortunate um, that our publisher, Claudia, was so chill about the whole process you know she she definitely you know early on i think uh, i showed her some of these um you know this the digital versions and she was like yeah okay cool you know she was like she was very uh enthusiastic and positive and i think matthew also saw some early versions of this but then i had this whole other idea that i was going to end up painting it um and then so i just kind of like uh disappeared for a while and um and then and then when I, and I think Claudia came over to my studio and then I was showing her the actual painting which I actually I have some of them here I don't know if you guys can see it on my screen but yeah they're sort of like they're painted like I said with I, I using this Japanese uh, acrylic gouache um which is a uh, really great um they have uh um, really, a lot of like really great colors um, and uh, super easy to uh, paint with. Uh, highly recommend it. It's called Acrylla. Here's another version of people that didn't make it in the book that I just painted on the backside. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, here's uh, this, this spread too. That spread um, is an interesting one to think about in terms of process because we were looking at like recreating the mural in Pisa because it's such an important spread to the book, that Pisa moment. But because of the restrictions in terms of duplicating Keith's art, we we're like, okay, so we can't show the mural. And so Josh had to figure out like, what am I going to do? Like, how do I give the feeling of the mural, the idea of the mural? Um, and that's ultimately where we landed, which really, if you go online and you look at the Pisa mural, you, it is a combination of like the mood of the mural and also the mood of the dance party that happened when the mural was completed. So it's this merging of those two and just felt like such a 
from our point of view, such a brilliant solution to a really challenging problem. Yeah, this, this spread was hard. Um, you know, I, I think uh, thematically it was, it really, I wanted to hit that note of, you know, this sort of celebration at the end yeah. of the book, you know, like, like uh, we kind of talked about Keith uh, passing away from AIDS earlier, you know, so like, I felt, I felt like really wanted to hit the celebration, but also didn't want to, also like didn't want to copy his actual mural. Yeah. Um, but the, but, you know, the, the text was also like super specific about this particular mural. So I felt like uh, we had to find a, some sort of solution and I'm really, uh, really glad that I uh, ended up doing, doing that for this one. It makes um, me think too, Josh, about another aspect of the collaboration that people might not think about right away is like the emotional tonality of the book and how it progresses. So you have that in the words, you have like the emotion that is being evoked through the words. And then there's like the challenge of visually representing that. And how do you even do that? I mean, so for me, like it's because it's subtle and like the way that the book culminates is it takes us to a very sad place and the child reader to a sad place. And then also it lifts us up and it does that in a really short amount of space. So how do you do that visually? How do you create that uplift and how do you soften the low and then also bring us up? And I think it was pretty exciting to see what Josh created and how that merged with the words. Just like, it's such an interesting, subtle process. Yeah, I think uh, that, you know, the, that particular uh, spread where, um, you know, where it's about Keith uh, dying, you know, felt really, yeah, exactly. That felt, uh, yeah, that spread. Yeah. That felt like so hard in a way, like I, I didn't want to, I really didn't want to have this like super sad, like, you know, bleak sort of thing. Cause that felt, you know, that would feel so kind of opposite of what we were trying to say here. But I also wanted, you know, I think maybe we also talked about you, you were, you were, I think you were, you were saying that Keith, there should be some sort of uh, image where Keith was looking directly at you, you know, yeah. kind of like addressing the viewer, which, uh, which, was uh, really important, I think, you know, like really like kind of like, like, you know, very honest and very open and very, very him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that was also, yeah, that was a conversation we had too. It was like that moment, when does Keith pause and look at us, look at the reader, right. connect. Right. And so how do you create an image that feels present and centered in that way? Yeah. And yeah. you did it, like you did it. Um, it's like you, I don't know, it, it holds that moment. It holds the emotion of that, of that page, that spread. Oh. I'm curious if anyone who's here, if you, if any questions are coming up or if any thoughts or questions, like. I don't see any, I, I have a few problems. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. Well, I, I was a little curious about the writing process too. And um, was this a book something that you had pitched to Enchanted Line, or is this something that they approached you about, or like how did the book even come about? Um, I, I do you want me to share a couple images? Sure. I'm, I'm curious if the people here might want to see this, but I'll just show a couple images to tell that story. Um, there's a long version and then there's a shorter version. I'm just gonna do the shorter version. Um, can you see this? Yeah, yeah. So for me, um, there's like the long version talks about my childhood fascination with Keith Haring and in a world without the internet and how I tried to, how I tracked him and saw his images and like was drawn to them. But then it was in 2012 when the Brooklyn Museum had this retrospective of his of his early work is 78 to 82 and um and i knew that i loved keith but when i was there it was one of those moments which i'm sure you guys have all had everyone who's here where you you go to a museum and you you can't predict it but it's like 
one of those shows where you just get totally reassembled. <laughs> like you leave and you're like with a new clarity or like a more excitement. And that's what happened. And I was looking at, um, I was reading the, you know, the placards on the wall and like these quotes from his journals. I had never read his journals at the time. And I just kept thinking, so I'm a poet and I had been teaching poetry in New York City public schools to kids for 10 years at that time. So I was reading these excerpts like I have fallen into poetry and it has swallowed me up. And I started learning about his life and I and I was like, wait, this artist who I've loved my whole life is actually like feels like a kindred spirit. Um, and and then there was this quote that said like, um, you know, I will never forget some of the adults that touched my life through my childhood. Sometimes very brief encounters have made an impact that is very lasting and very real. Uh, if it is possible for me to have that kind of effect on any children, I think that would be the most important and useful thing I could do. And I read that and I was like, at that time, there was no picture book biography about Keith. And I just thought this book feels like aligned with his wishes. Like I felt like he was expressing those wishes to reach young people. And I had just published my first children's book about E.E. E. Cummings at the time. So I was like, aha, you know, and I, I, that moment I was like, I want to write a book about Keith. Um, and I got the, one of these books and it had this like, this like beautiful cursive where it's like, when I grow up, I would like to be an artist in France. Because he was 10 years old at the time. The reason is because I like to draw. I would get my money from the pictures I would sell. I hope I will be one. And I saw that and I was like, this is amazing. I mean, he, he had this incredible childhood, which would be represented in the book. And it feels like he would want the book to exist. So this is um, in the exhibition, they had those like etch -a sketches. And so this is me with some kid and I'm like drawing um, in response to Keith Haring. And I, and I realized that when I was a kid, I was imitating Keith Haring. Like my whole doodle style was totally inspired by Keith Haring. And I would make these ceramics with Keith Haring kind of vibe, you know? So uh, this is what I was working on. And then, and then this, after I decided a couple of years, I held on to it a couple of years. And I was like, when I finished my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, I was like, okay, hey, now I'm going to write this book. And I was in Berlin, and which is just so full of amazing public art. And, um, and I sat at my desk and I was starting to work on, um, so this is a little out of order started to like read through the journals and mark things and creating like a wall of, of notes. And so for anyone who's interested in the writing process, it's like I was starting to assemble fragments of his life, anecdotes, stories, moments that might, might go into the story. And then just kind of covered the wall and tried to create a timeline so I could imagine how the story might be assembled. Um, and so that's just like a little, window into the process. It just was collecting gems and then writing them down and assembling them and trying to find a through line, like trying to find a story that I wanted to tell. Here on this image, you can see like Pisa exclamation point. Like I was like, that Pisa moment is super important because it was a highlight for him. Um, and then as I, so, so I was taking my first super awkward steps at trying to write it and um, at the time in Berlin, there's this, well, there's, there continues to be this amazing international children's bookstore called Mundo Azul. So this is the summer that I'm like, my main, you know, project was to write this. And, uh, and I walked into this bookstore and they were having an exhibition by a New York artist who had made a book called like New York Inside Out. What was it called, Josh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, New York Inside and Out. New York Inside and Out. And so this back room of this bookstore had, jo had Josh Cochran drawings all over it. And it was New York. And I was like, wow. And then there's this a series of drawings. And I looked at this drawing. This is the photo I took in 2015. And I took a picture because I was like, that looks like Keith Haring. That drawing to me looks like Keith Haring. OK, at the time, I had no idea who Josh was. Josh wasn't illustrating this book. This is just total serendipity. I took this picture and then I bought his book. Um, 
which I have behind me somewhere, and I put it on my desk. I accordion, it was an accordion book, and I opened it up on my writing desk because I liked it so much. And so I had Josh's book opened up on my desk as I wrote the manuscript for Drawing Walls. But it, it didn't occur to me, I didn't put it together. And then when I finished it and I sent it to Claudia at Enchanted Lion, we started moving forward and we were looking for an illustrator and we, we found someone else who we thought might be great and, and it traveled that road for a while and it didn't work out. And then the, the next summer, so this is the summer of 2016, Claudia sent me this email with the link to Josh's Google search for Josh Cochran and said, any connection for you here? And this is my reply. I was like, yes. <laughs> Actually, I bought his book at Mundo Zul two summers ago. I'm a fan. Um, and then this is like a copy of Josh's message. So it's a longer story, but it's pretty cool how it came together. It just felt very miraculous when it when it circled back around and it was Josh, whose image, it wasn't an image of Keith, but it looked like Keith and it was the seed. Also, I, I think I think for me, uh, this whole process, like just getting to know each other, you know, more and more, I, I realized that, that we have so much like similarities and we have, there's a lot of overlap regardless. So it was interesting to see that we were like kind of drawn uh, towards each other with these little fragments. And uh, that's kind of a cool thing about uh, uh, meeting people that way, you know. Are becoming friends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, it looks like we have so Chrissy, first of all, second grade teacher in Seattle. That's amazing. I, I teach poetry to second graders. Second graders is that's one of my the ages that I've worked with. Um, and so that sounds really great. And actually, I'm gonna just put my email here because maybe um if you want to email me, maybe we could think about. Or I could give you some ideas or feedback about projects you could do with kids that involve poetry too, or writing too. Um, and then it looks like Melissa says, I had a question for either Matthew or Josh. Was there anything new you learned about Keith or his work that was surprising during the, I love that question, during the process of making this book? Um, so Josh, do you wanna field that? Uh, you know, I guess I, I, guess I was uh, surprised even though I knew about the celebrity connections, I was, you know, when I read the journals, then I really, you know, he was, he's like name dropping these huge, huge names in the art world. And then uh, uh, that was, kind of, for me, that was kind of a, a surprise um, just to really uh, see how deeply connected he was uh, with the New York scene here um in the 80s like you know a huge huge artist so um that was kind of cool to for me to read yeah and i think i think i kind of answered that melissa in a way in my talk right now is that i didn't know i had no idea that he had this connection with kids like that he understood the intelligence and imagination of, of kids that he had such a respect and such an appreciation so that was the discovery, I guess, that led me to want to write it. Um, and then during the process, there's so many moments of serendipity, like the another one I described, where I think one of the pleasures is um, is learning more and more and more and more about the subject and just like completely immersing in the subject. Um, one thing that did happen is that there's a neighbor across the street, so just out the window, who out the window from my street on Union Street, and uh, there's this guy who puts um, signs in the window that say like funny witticisms. They're like word images, and he puts them in the front window, and people are always stopping and laughing and taking pictures. And um, I, for ten years, I had been seeing his pictures in the window, and uh, and then this summer before I left for Berlin. I saw, I saw two guys riding his Vespa away, like suddenly. And I was like, oh no. And I, so I knocked on the door and he answered the door and I was like, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I live across the street. I'm sorry to break this to you, but I think, I think someone might've just stolen your Vespa. And he was like, oh no. And they, it's true, they did steal his Vespa. So it was like, I felt really bad. And then about a week later, I was leaving for the summer and I was like, maybe he can use mine because I had a Vespa that I was going to put in storage for the summer. So I knocked on the door and I was like, I had an idea. Um, 
would you, if I parked my Vespa in your yard, like you could use it all summer. And I already called my insurance and they said it was okay. So he was like, hey, oh yeah, yeah, interesting. He's like, hey, come in. So he waves me in and I walk in and uh, he walks into this room and I'm like, oh, this guy's an artist. Like, I didn't realize the extent to which this guy's an artist. And there was a glass case with a phone, a telephone painted neon pink with like a Tyrannosaurus, plastic Tyrannosaurus like on the handle. And I was like, that looks like a Kenny Sharp phone. And he goes, it is a Kenny Sharp phone. And I was like, whoa, if he has a Kenny Sharp telephone, and so I said, I said, you know, I'm working on a book about Keith Haring. And he was like, I love Keith. I was friends with Keith. And I was like, what? One of Keith's friends, like he goes, he worked for the Tony Shafrazi gallery as a young guy. And, and so he goes, hold on a second. And he goes up the stairs. This guy's George Horner, lives across the street still. And he comes back with this incredible, like doll, it was, a, was it a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill with a, childhood photo of Keith Haring pasted over the president's face against a gold background. And it's like for George. And he shows that to me and, and it's like he, so anyways, this George now is a friend and we were able to give a copy of Drawing on Walls to George um, that Josh personalized. And in exchange, he disappeared again into his upstairs archive and, uh, he gave us both, both me and Josh, an original sticker, like one of yeah. these, a couple of these stickers that Keith made, you know, small batches. And then this other kind of amazing treasure, which is um, a check <laughs> from the Tony Shafrazi gallery uh, that he kind of took. It was like already cashed. And on the back, um, Keith signed it. So I have Keith's signature on this check. So crazy. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that's a, I mean, it's been an hour. So I actually, I think that's a good note, note to end on. <laughs> unless, unless you guys have other questions. Um, uh, you can also feel free to, uh, you know, find us on Instagram and hit us up or whatever if there's any anything else that comes up. Yeah, I'd love to know what, what you're both working on now. I mean, I'm sure, Matthew, you're, you're probably, are, are you working on another book or? Yeah, right now, um, my next book is about this pop artist named Karita Kent. She was a Roman Catholic nun who started pulling silk screens in the 60s in Los Angeles. And she, she saw Warhol's um, soup cans at the Ferris Gallery in 1962 and started incorporating pop imagery and like images from the supermarket and, and lines from E.E. E. Cummings and lines from John Lennon. And she kind of was merging the spiritual and the, the everyday. She was also a really amazing teacher of art. Do you know Sister Carita, Carita Kent? Uh -huh. Never heard, of Never heard of that. So yeah, she's my next subject for a picture book biography. Very cool. Well, cool. I'm, I'm working. I'm. I'm sorry. That's no, and I was just saying. I hope to make another book with Josh. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to find. A, we're trying to find a good project. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to work on a book about uh, uh, camping right now, and so that's been on the on the burner, sort of chipping away at that. Did you say camping?